the guy hurt really badly. He had a big laceration right above his eyes. You just couldn't tell because of all the blood. Who was ready? Got on scene and found the uh, vessel hard to ground on an island. Ah! The training is intense. Just give, give him my best shot. Easy for to right? It's very vital, especially in Alaska, to be ready for certain things. And my number one job is to make sure the patient comes back alive. The vast Alaskan wilderness, a place where beauty is cloaked by danger. Here every day, 350 highly trained men and women risk their lives to save others. America's deadliest waters are protected by Coast Guard Alaska. The vessel in risk of going down. All right. Any injuries? We got woke up at 3:30 uh, this morning to the uh, SAR alarm for a uh, vessel with a 406 EPIRB going off. And so we knew we had uh, some people uh, who were in distress. An EPIRB is a radio beacon that it gives us a starting point to just plug into our flight computer and beeline right to rescue people in need. These are calm, fog, 15 knots of wind. They're in their six minute survival raft with their uh, survival suits on. It's tied to the vessel currently. They said they can't tell that there's been a breach of the hold. I wasn't even expecting it to still be dark. Yeah, it won't be dark for long. Alaska is a very extreme environment, and we try and instill that upon all of our personnel when you talk about the survivability rates and two to five minutes to live when folks go in the water, it's critical for us to be able to respond. It's also critical for us to be able to make sure that our aircraft are equipped and responding with the most highly trained personnel and with the best prepared equipment that they can so that we ourselves do not become a, a search and rescue case. Got on scene and found the vessel hard to ground on an island. The crew had done really well to prepare themselves. They uh, had gotten in their survival suits, gotten into the life raft, and tied the life raft off the vessel so they wouldn't float away. Who was ready? Boy swimmer. Who was in the water? Who was swimming out to three o'clock? All right, what's going on, fellas? Okay. All right, two to deal. First thing we do is we assess the survivors, make sure that they're not injured, that they're ready to get out of there, that they got all their essentials, if they've got medical issues, all their medications, and then we just get them out as fast as possible. And now you can ring the basket. Ready for what? Basket hoist as a survivor. Hoist complete. Roger, get the survivor out of the basket. When I get the survivors back onto the helo, try to show them that I'm calm so that they know that this is normal everyday business for the Coast Guard. And then I knew I still had two guys in danger that were still over in the raft. So, you know, of course, it's not over till it's over. And score is at the hook. Good position. Score is hooking up to the hoist hook. Roger. And hold. He's directly below us. Bring your basket up to the cabin door. Roger. I get the survivors back onto the helo. There's some guys that are wild-eyed and never been through anything like that before, and it's devastating. Uh, just make sure they're comfortable. You know, try not to stir up any worries or fears about the boat that they just left. I mean, that's their livelihood. I'm just telling them they've got to get in the 
The captain was pretty distraught by having to leave his boat. You know, he had to leave his livelihood behind. So I had to reassure him that, you know, it's just material that can be replaced. Having a hard time getting the driver in the basket. You won't be left behind, don't you say? Sometimes it is difficult to get a survivor in the basket. They get caught up in the moment. They've never been in a situation like that before. You just gotta make eye contact with them, let them know that you know, it's, it's all good. And once you put them in the basket and they realize that they're going up into the helicopter, that you know, the worst of it's over. Roger, rescue checklist complete. Once we get all the survivors secured in the aircraft, we make our way back home as fast as possible, just in case there's any medical emergencies. Uh, the mission's not complete until we're all safe on deck. We were uh, in a tight spot, and they showed up, and we're heroes. We did everything perfectly. Calmed us down, they assessed the situation, They went through the right motions. Everybody doing good back there? They are, they're all in good shape. Thank God for them. God bless them. This is up. Now the third time, they've pulled me out of the water. With the helicopter. <laughs> and once by boat. Yeah, once by boat. Thank you, you still security. live to tell yeah. about it. I mean, this is, what, 20 years ago? Yeah, 91, it was... Uh, so almost 20, 20 and a half years ago? 20 or something years ago. I wasn't even born yet. <laughs> <laughs> that makes me feel old. <laughs> no, this rescue is very remarkable in many ways. You know, this is this guy's third time getting picked up out of the ocean. It's one of our first cases, you know, dating back 20 years ago. So we never forget the people, you know? And I don't think they forget us either. It's just amazing to me. I'm when getting the, goosebumps. Look, I'm getting goosebumps. Yeah, I wouldn't get 40 foot seas. Oh my God, I'm blowing 80. Like, blowing 80, 120, I think, gusts. And I mean, this is the we're first. in the water eight hours. Wow. I How many hours in the water? I think six hours, six, seven hours. And an H Street like came out and got you. Yeah, yeah, the C-130 found us, and then uh, when we seen them, we were kind of happy that we knew maybe somebody was coming. Isn't that amazing? Wow. Tell me that's not amazing, sir. It's amazing. Yeah, look in good shape, right? You're that's you, what's amazing, you know. right? <laughs> I believe in karma. Karma's huge. When you really get, you know, the crap scared out of you, and you come back from it, and you save somebody's life, it's the best thing ever. You know, it's like, um, I don't know, winning a lottery. I think it's one of them moments in life where you always remember, you know, knowing that, you, you basically gave somebody life, you know, as a crew. So that's huge. Let's get more pudding for you, Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> We did get a new airman to Air Station Kodiak. Doors away. The training is intense. You kind of kind of prove yourself to these guys. We had an incident where a gentleman suffered a severe head injury. He had a very big laceration right above his eyes. You just couldn't tell because of all the blood. Good morning, Captain Ops CEO. So right now, these guys are returning from a SAR case. This was a um, fishing vessel. They set off their EPIRB. Got a call from our District 17 Command Center to send the helicopter to the fishing vessel Bear, which has uh, three persons on board run aground. They lowered the rescue swimmers to the water, uh, hoisted up the three crewmen of fishing vessel Bear, recovered the rescue swimmer, and uh, came back. Clearly a uh, potential life-threatening situation, but uh, worked out great. Um, not every medevac is going to work out quite that well, but it uh, worked out great this time. Three lives saved, yes, sir. When the case is over and, and the job is done, you've got that sense of satisfaction, and you come back to a community where uh, the people really appreciate the Coast Guard. That's incredibly rewarding. Coast Guard, we all move during the summer months. That's our transfer season. New personnel coming in, old personnel leaving. 
We did get a new airman to Air Station Kodiak. Uh, he's a little bit different in our typical airman. Mike Hernan is actually a petty officer. He's an MK3. Uh, so he's already a rated personnel. So he's decided now he wants to become an AST rescue swimmer. My name is Michael Hernan. I'm a machinery technician, third class, petty officer in the airman program, switching rates. So here I am. I heard the program's really intense, really demanding, but I'm ready. I've been training hard, just giving give my best shot. Welcome to Kodiak. It's been a busy first day, but this is par for the course. This program is going to take a toll on you over the next few months. You have to be willing to sacrifice that. Over the next four months, you are going to be enduring some of the most physically challenging environments that you have ever been in. I cannot impress enough on you as how important it is to focus on what's at hand here. We cannot afford to make mistakes because when we make mistakes, people lose their life. But you got to put your heart and your soul into it to be successful at this. You're going to be in some instances and environments that you are not going to feel comfortable in. You must tough through it. Good? Good, Chief. Hey, welcome aboard. Thanks, Chief. I wish you the best. And uh, remember, this is a short four-month period for the goal of a lifetime. As long as you keep that in the back of your mind, you'll do well. I came in here not really knowing what the ex expectations were going to be, but um, I knew they were going to be demanding, for sure. He said it was tough, but um, just push through it, don't give up. Line up over here, guys. We're going to do a roll call real quick. Go to that clam. This is the 2011 Eco Challenge, U.S. Coast Guard Eco Challenge. It's put on by NWR, Morale, Welfare, and Recreation. It's a division of the Coast Guard that connects us to the local community. Here we go. Right over there is the trail. Go, go. Okay. I'm Anna Arnold. My dad's in the Coast Guard here in Kodiak, and I'm here for the Kodiak 2011 Eco Challenge. My team is the Kodiak Clam. I raced with Claude, Nate, and Steve. Claude and I did it together last year, so we wanted to team up again this year. It's just a ton of fun because it's just, you're out there just doing it, you know? Beautiful day in Kodiak. You know, it's just fun being out there with people you like. That guy a little coat. Worthless, Claude. You're worthless. Mm -hmm. The race is about 11 hours. Tough course this year. We trekked a lot, and the rafting is intense. Claude went ahead first with his camera in the, in the water. Nate, help me, Nate. I'm drowning. Then he had a meltdown. Stand up, rescue swimmer. <laughs> yes, camera on. We got our butts kicked right. that whole river. Come here. Oh. Final major obstacle, of course, was a uh, zip line across Saloni Creek. Once we got across, we had a mad dash to the finish line. Go, you guys, go! All right, you're good to go. Watch your fingers. So at the traverse, I was going across, you know, and I was screaming across. You gotta push through those bushes. Oh, God. <laughs> That's awesome. Oh, yeah, perfect clearance. I, I got jammed up there. Oh. Ah. We lost Claude for a minute there. Nate and Steve and Anna pull me. I'm, I'm not embarrassed. I'm 280 pounds, you know? That's what the team's all about, you know, equal challenge. Everybody help each other out and get across. I'd rather jam a pencil in my eye twice and do that again. Our families are here at the finish line. We came in fourth, but it's not about winning. It's about bringing everybody together, community and Coast Guard. good time. It's challenging, and you feel very accomplished when you're done. The Coast Guard is totally about teamwork. The Coast Guard is all about making families happy, you know, taking care of the people. It's the best job in town. He had severe trauma. He was combative. Pretty substantial head injury, open wounds. He was bleeding everywhere. I tried to get some vitals, but for the most part, I was trying to hold them down. They're fighting you because they don't know what's going on.
with any airman candidate, it's an evaluation process, and it's a holistic evaluation process. We did get a new airman to Air Station Kodiak. Mike Hernan is actually a petty officer. He's decided now he wants to become an AST rescue swimmer. All right, so music, go ahead and be Petty Officer Hearn spotter, please. Okay, no rest, muscle failure. Go. With Petty Officer Hernan, we'll do the PTN test. It'll start out with the land portion of PT, and then we'll go on to the mile and a half run, 500 yard swim, and then the uh, underwaters. <laughs> Yeah. All right, good up. Okay, all the way up. Go. The end test was much more difficult than I imagined. Ever since I joined the Coast Guard, I've wanted to become a rescue swimmer, and I'm going to do whatever it takes to get into the program. Okay, you're done. You're done. Very well. Shake it off, blow it out. Stretch out your calves, your hamstrings, your quads, and get ready to run. All right, all right? Thank you. Thank you. Get out there, go for a mile and a half run, get the lead out. Okay, I'm looking for a, a personal best from you is what I'm looking for. Set, go. I joined the Coast Guard back in 2007. Been in for a little over four years now. I was a machinery technician, and I'm switching rates over, just doing what I want to do now. I got a decent time on my run. I kept pace with Airman Music, and now we're getting ready to go into the pool portion of the end test. Growing up in California, I was close to the beach, so I have a lot of experience, you know, swimming around, being comfortable in the water. Underwater, I guess I'll just wait and see. <laughs> All right, we're gonna do four underwaters. You're gonna swim the full length of the pool underwater. Do you have any questions? No, senior chief. Set. Go. The pool, that was my toughest spot. I think that's most everybody's. Certain things, especially underwater, that's where it was really tough. Your brain's telling you to pop. You need oxygen. But you can hold your breath longer than you think. So you just have to fight through the urges. It was hard because you gotta kind of prove yourself to these guys. Okay, perhaps you're Hernan. That is the completion of the Airman uh, PT in test, and you've successfully completed it. Okay, so you are officially in the program. All right. Nice so good job this morning. Good numbers. Go ahead and head to the locker room and get changed out. Then. Nice, nice, All right. Nice. He did well. So yeah, he's a good candidate for our program. So today with Petty Officer Hernan, he passed this test. And we moved to another situation, which is more real life. I'm just looking for his comfort in water. Uh, see how he reacts to the rotor wash of the helicopter. See how he reacts to some of the other conditions. Any time they'll take an airman out on a flight, they serve in a position as a survivor, typically called a duck. Duck flights, um, me as the, the victim. You want to get an individual in any kind of environment, make sure that they can handle the really bad stuff later on in their career. Because today is a training environment. He's got someone with him. Once he gets out in the search rescue case and he's in some dark and stormy weather, he's on his own. Because if the individual is possibly panicked or stricken a little bit now, we need to educate them and train them as to how to deal with those type of situations. The training is intense. They hand me the hook, I hook up. Everything has to be precise. I mean, it makes sense because if I mean, if you screw up once, it could be, could be. <laughs> right when I hit the water, unhook and just swim at the helicopter's one, two o'clock position. Just sitting out there in the ocean by myself is is unreal. Ready for one free fall deployment of the swimmer. Doors away. When they're being survivors, they get an idea of what it's like when that helicopter approaches and they're being tossed about due to the rotor wash. Swimmer is clear of the water. Swimmer is halfway up. Swimmer is at the cabin door. When I'm out there being the survivor, I just try to take it all in. I get some of this. Roger. Thank you so much. Outside cabin for a load check. Because hopefully 
I'll be in their position one day. Roughly around 2 a.m. we got the call. It was reports of a 22-year-old male vomiting blood, uh, appendicitis. Just have to go get our stuff ready and we have to load up the plane. Get ready to go. My name is AST3 Rafael Aguero and I am a rescue swimmer here at Air Station Kodiak. Call came in, a medevac 200 miles southwest of Kodiak, a possible guy with appendicitis. Every mission that we do out here is time critical. Emergency survival equipment, make sure everybody's got your appropriate gear. Yes, sir. Okay. No questions, we'll head on out. My name is Lieutenant John Kirk, and uh, currently I'm standing the uh, operations duty officer watch. So we have the container vessel with the individual with uh, appendicitis down here, which is approximately 280 nautical miles to the southwest of Kodiak, which is located here. A burst appendix can be potentially life-threatening, so uh, we wanted to be able to, to get him off the, the vessel as soon as possible. I am Philippe de Freitas, a medevac specialist. I get my stuff, and then I'm, I'm ready to rumble. And this patient was actually appendicitis, so I had to get all the you know medication, uh, narcotics, that kind of stuff, and we carry about 200-some pounds worth of gear. It's a medevac of a 22-year-old male who's vomiting up blood. Calling like a half a mile biz with fog. Hopefully that'll clear out by the time we get there, and we're gonna see 130 flying out there with us to uh, give us an update on uh, the weather and, and the information. So if all goes well, hopefully we'll get out there as the sun's coming up and uh, get them off and get them back here. Brad Steinbach, a petty officer second class and aviation maintenance technician. My job involves hoisting the basket and to the deck and loading up the survivor and bringing him back into the cabin. You don't really know what's going to happen when you get there, so you just kind of plan for what you can. When we got on scene, it was still pretty dark out. We decided to lower the basket to the deck. The deck was pretty wet, so when I had the basket on deck, it decided to slide around a little bit. Slid right on in over the boat, picked him up. I get him in the cabin, and then I start assessing the things that I may need to do for him. Vital signs, IV, a very important thing to start right off the bat. And then I also check his uh, blood glucose. Um, and from then on, uh, is just monitoring, make sure that he's doing well, all his vital signs are stable. And my number one job as the medical person on board is to make sure the patient comes back alive. The great thing I think about my job and how it helps is, for example, this patient that I had today, appendicitis, I was able to actually, with the training that I've had through the Coast Guard, diagnose him that he actually had the appendicitis and be able to treat him accordingly. In my eyes, I have the best job as a flight mechanic in Kodiak, Alaska. It's in the Coast Guard. You can, nothing better. If you go out and save people and come back, the place is beautiful. This one went very well. Had an ambulance waiting for him on deck, and it was a good day for us. It could have been a better day for him. HS2, Philippe de Freitas. I work as an aviation mission specialist. We fly medevacs. 
When I'm not at work, I am a blasted man, married to a beautiful wife, and have two little girls. I have a, a three-year-old and a, a 10-month-old. Here we go. I have a very, very, very supportive wife. All right. Good job, big girl. I'm what I am because of her, and I have no doubt about that. Thank you so much. Well, I'm, I'm very proud of him. I couldn't be happier with the choices that he's made and, and, and how that reflects on us as a family. I was born and raised in Brazil, moved up here to America, and always want to serve the military here. So I stopped for a sec, and I was like, you know, I can't really be jumping off helicopters shooting at people, but I can save lives. And so I did. You know, she's crawling. Awesome. The 10 month old, you start crawling right now, so I, I, you know, make sure to be part of that as much as I can. Look at the ball, look at the ball. And the three year old, I mean, she's all about playing, you know, playing sports. It gets hard sometimes because he's the one that everybody can go to to get stuff done. When you're doing this profession and you have to be as away from the family as sometimes you must be, it's very difficult. And so sometimes he stays longer at work because of that. Well, definitely this is the moment we work for. Uh, you know, come home and uh, have a healthy family, healthy home. You know, if it's my calling in life to take care of our family while he's away saving other people, it's worth it. Petty Officer Hernan has definitely progressed throughout the uh, program since he's been here. The Airman program currently they go to an air station for four months, and that's the beginning of their phase to become helicopter rescue swimmers. The first few weeks were intense just because I wasn't used to it. But as weeks went on, I wouldn't say it got easier, but I got more comfortable in the water. Getting over the hump feels awesome. Squirt. You want to see me, Chief? Pay off the Come on in. Got good news for you. I have orders for you for AST Airman A School. Awesome. Thanks, Chief. All right, so now the real deal begins. What we do here in the Airman program is just prepare him for the rigors that he'll see in, at A School. A School, they get much deeper and much more heavily involved. They definitely, the PT steps up to a different level. You've done a good job here in this program. I expect nothing but the same from you. Make me proud by doing what you're capable of doing. I right, Chief. Okay? Stay strong and keep pushing forward. Sounds Congratulations. Good, Thanks again. All Thanks right. for all your support. You bet. You have to remember there's only 350 ASTs in the Coast Guard. And uh, that's a very small group when you're talking about 35,000 active duty members in the Coast Guard. You develop a strong tie with an individual that you know, hey, I can trust you with my life. I can trust you with my child's life. That's even more important. We're all in it together and we all got each other's back. Got through the program, 16 weeks. It was real tough. Didn't know what to expect coming here, but I made it. Looking back on day one to now, it's a huge difference. It's been a tough four months, and moving on to the next step feels good. I'm ready. I feel great. I'm in the best shape of my life, and it's just going to get better. I haven't told my mom I received orders yet. She'll probably cry. <laughs> We had an incident where a gentleman on a purse uh, suffered a severe head injury. Um, a block and tackle came back, struck him in the face. Um, we got that call at about 9, 10 o'clock. So they're working towards Uzinki Island, if you could see it here. Not too far away from us, almost in our backyard. XO, let's go. Hi, I'm Chief Brumley. I'm the officer in charge of Ant Kodiak. It's AIDS navigation team. Basically, what the deal is, is the decision was made not to launch a helicopter due to the low ceilings. So we've been asked if we can go out and assist with the medevac. So we're taking a crew on the 41-footer 
headed out toward Uziki to meet up with the boat. Board clear. All right. We're in the green. We're gonna head out. My name is MK3 Richard. I'm the engineer on the small boat. We got underway. The ceiling was dropped, so we couldn't, they couldn't launch a helicopter yet. The guy had sustained some facial injuries, so what was going through our heads was, how are we gonna be able to get this person out of here? We got a call from Sector Anchorage reporting that a member of a fishing vessel had gotten struck in the face with a deck fitting. Messed his face up pretty good. Uh, they want to medevac him from the fishing boat back to Kodiak. The decision was made not to launch a helicopter due to the low ceilings, so we're going to use our resource to get him medical attention. So we're about halfway there. We get a call from Sector Anchorage. They let us know that the victim, his condition was worsening. So they were launching the helicopter to get him from Uzinki. We made the decision to continue uh, out there uh, just to make sure that he had a resource and a way to get back to uh, proper medical you know, treatment. My name is Scott Gordon. I'm a AST-1 rescue swimmer here in Kodiak, Alaska. We got a call for a case over in Azinki for somebody that uh, has a head injury. The weather's cleared up a little bit. We're going to be able to make our way over there. Not real sure what we're going to get into. You know, we get the sense that we need to maybe hurry a little bit, you know, still being safe. But at the same time, we need to get over there because we do have somebody with a head injury. We need to bring him back here to Kodiak so he can get some proper medical care. Hey, hey, come down. So the boat crew will meet the patient in Ozinki, and they're going to transport him to the landing strip, and we're going to go ahead and meet him there and pick him up and bring him back to Kodiak. The harbor master met us. We made sure to let him know that uh, they were sending a helicopter. Somebody want to come up to the clinic and assess? So I sent two of my crewmen with the harbor master to help assist getting the victim room to the helicopter. I'm Dan Clary, and I'm the mayor of the city of Uzinki, and also the acting harbor master and fire chief. We've got a fisherman that was uh, apparently his ring bar snapped when they're pulling up the weight, and it, the bar hit him in his face, and it looks like probably most of his facial bones are probably broken. Right now, they're treating him at the clinic. He stopped breathing a couple times, and he's lost quite a bit of blood. All right, they're going to be uh, meeting us here in about uh, 15 minutes from now. Yeah, I think we'll be able to get him ready. Keep your pulse steady. He's going between 40 and 60 on his pulse. Uh, I do have 4 milligrams of lorazepam on board because he has been seizing. He's also been vomiting blood and he is mad up. Okay, I've got 176 over 82 at 10.38. The medical facilities in Uzinki were actually outstanding. The people that were working there were doing a really good job. They had him in a gurney. He had a very big laceration right above his eyes, his nose, and his, some of his teeth were either missing or you just couldn't tell because of all the blood. Is the ambulance ready? They're ready. We're ready. Let's do it. Okay, Daniel, we're going to move you, buddy. Daniel, this is Irene. I'm helping you breathe. Whoa, whoa, whoa. One, two, three. Okay. Nice and easy. Okay, you Good. Good. Head or feet? First. Head first, please. Head first, please. Okay. Got you. We're moving you, Daniel. You look good. As soon as we could get him stable enough in the gurney, then we could start thinking about transporting him. He was vomiting 
So we needed to make sure that he wasn't gonna choke on his own vomit or suffocate himself. We had to make sure all that would pass before we could transport him and we finally got him stable enough to get him into the ambulance. I'm David Call, HS3 over the clinic at EMT Emergency Medicine. We went and picked him up. We were told that he had severe trauma and that he was combative. He was having a pretty tough time, pretty substantial head injury. He had some uh, open wounds. He was bleeding everywhere. The nose injury was pretty wide. You know, he had some bones protruding, so it was pretty substantial. So we brought him, put him on the helo, made sure that his head was towards the door just in case because they said he was puking up dark blood, which usually means that the blood from his sinuses and his nose is going into his stomach and coagulating. So once we got up to about 200 feet, he started getting more combative, which probably means there's intracranial pressure swelling or blood inside his cranium. We kept bagging him. I tried to get some vitals, but for the most part, I was trying to hold him down. At one point, it took myself and the AMT both to hold him down. For the most part, he was fighting us the whole way. You know, head injury, that kind of thing will happen. They're fighting you because they don't know what's going on. He was responsive to painful stimuli around his lower occipital towards the nose. His nose right here, the gash, ran down like this. Um, his nose was actually, instead of on the lip, his nose was about an inch higher. I tried to check his eyes, but his eyes were so swollen that I actually could not see his eye. I got a call this morning for a, a medevac for a guy who was on a fishing boat and he got hurt. The weather that day wasn't good. We had a, a really low layer fog. Visibility wasn't too good. I'd say three quarters to a mile. So we started moving in that direction via boat vessel transport. And then the, the severity of the injuries kind of came to us or to our district office and they asked for the launch. It was a solid team effort as far as the amp boat made it on scene and they were able to transport that victim or help take that victim out of the local clinic where further transport from the 60 picked him up to get him back here to medical attention in Kodiak. When we got on scene, they brought him right to us, the helicopter, we landed. He was pretty combative, uh, unresponsive. He was having a pretty tough time, pretty substantial head injury. We continued to bag him the whole time. His pulse was, uh, Strong, but fast. It was an unusual pulse. It wasn't a steady pulse. Pretty much for the duration of the trip, I was over the top of him with my body weight on top, trying to hold him down. He was swiping at his face, trying to get the mask off. And I put a compress over his nose to try to stop the bleeding, kept it out of his eyes. I wiped as good as I could the blood away from his face to check and make sure there wasn't any more bleeding. Other than that, we did about all we could. It was a short transport time, but lucky for us, we didn't have to go very far. He didn't have real stable vitals for the most part on the way back here. Uh, we just got him back as quick as we could and get him in advanced care. Hey, calm down right here. It's all right. Relax. Relax. Hey, he's got blood coming out of his ears. He's combative, really combative. So. He's got major head trauma. There's blood coming out of his ears. Um, when we went up to 200 feet, he pretty much freaked out and okay. It was took we haven't pretty much. Been able to fight yeah, I haven't been able to really do anything. Uh, get him in the ambulance. 
is one of those cases where this is somebody that needs to get to the hospital and get, you know, definitely a higher level of advanced medical care than what we can provide for him. You know, it, it affects you, you know. It was, it was pretty severe. He's gonna need some kind of surgery and hope that, you know, he's gonna be okay. My son was in a terrible accident on a commercial fishing boat. They got him to Kodiak, saved my son's life. A number of people saved my son's life, but the, Cody, the Coast Guard were one of them. And then there was this wonderful Coast Guard young man that sat in the emergency room with me for a good hour. He sat there, held my hand, it was wonderful. And now, a month later, we are all here. We're friends put together a wonderful benefit dinner for Daniel. This is his college fund now. And uh, to help us through, because there's a lot of bills that need to be paid for this. The community in Kodiak got together, and this is a fundraiser, and it's all to help with the medical bills and for uh, a college bills for Daniel. Daniel is best friends with my son, Abraham. They're both young, aspiring fishermen. Could have been my son that got hurt, but it was Daniel. So we all stick together on this stuff. It's a small town, and I think we're there for each other. But I would like to mention that the Coast Guard is part of that community. Um, people here in the Coast Guard are very much appreciated for what they do. I mean, many of my friends are alive because the Coast Guard pulled them out of the water. We depend on the Coast Guard uh, with our lives. I think that's, that's the reality of it. The Coast Guard in Kodiak is important to us because they save our families, they save our children, they save our men and women who are out. We are very thankful and we are blessed that they're here and they provide a constant source of support for our fishing community, one of the most dangerous occupations in the world.